My speech is called The Plastic Power. I guess it's a summary of 10 years of 3D gun printing and what I've learned and maybe the completion of like the last few talks I've tried to give about the things I've learned and maybe give back. And you can apply these lessons, I think, not just within 3D printed guns, but probably to any hacking project. I think it fits within the dialectics of hacking, to use my friend Soderbergh's term. So uh, this talk is brought to you by this moment in 2001, a space odyssey, which at this point we've all had. Huh, hey, ChatGPT, I'm looking for literary criticism of Toni Morrison. Can you help me out? Geez, that's puzzling, Dave. I can't find anything. Uh, I'm sorry, Dave, nothing exists. Are you sure how? Nothing on the entire internet about Toni Morrison? Sorry, Dave, it's the most puzzling thing. Hmm. Uh, so we built GatGBT. Uh, because we all know, I mean, that's like the most relatable scene in 2001 at this point, the fact that AI will lie to you. I mean, that wasn't true until just a few years ago, right? We've all now probably experienced it. Uh, the damn thing lies to us, and it creates this postmodern condition, too, where uh, it, it even makes us feel bad for asking it the wrong question. Uh, so we've created GATGBT, a modest effort, I promise you. But with the state of open source software and these other projects, already 70 billion parameters, half the size of GPT 3.5. We didn't need any money to get there. So I'm mentioning it because we've just now started accepting uh, international participants in our, our private beta. Am I going to step out of the light if I? Yeah, OK. So gatgbt.com. Uh, this is the outline to my speech. The plastic power will try to go in three parts. You guys gave me like 45 minutes, right? Yeah, I can go over. I'll set a timer, though, just to make sure that I don't. Anyway, we have three. we have three segments, all right? It'll start with the uses of history, which is borrowed from Nietzsche's untimely meditations. I like Nietzsche. I try to be a Nietzschean. Uh, the second part will be about poetic misreading, what's called misprison and Harold Bloom. And the final part, we'll talk about technologies, uh, other plastic powers like profilicity. In general, the theme that should unite this is the plastic power. Well, plastic, that's a word that we're familiar with, right? It comes from Greek. The word itself might even be Pre-Greek, might even predate Indo-European language, it means to mold. This is an attic vase, it's to represent one anyway. And in classical Greek culture, these types of vases, maybe if they started on the wheel, they were finished by hand, but in the classical period, they were made in two-part molds. The artisan finished them by hand, you, you mold it yourself in the end, and they take on these fantastic and, and, and mythic figures. The point is, to mold and to have that power to mold, to take and to shape and, and to use what is past and foreign and to integrate it. This is what Nietzsche calls the plastic power in his second of the untimely meditations. The death athletic, which I guess you guys will see later, that has, no one has seen that yet, right? Maybe, maybe some of you will see it later. So um, the death athletic, I think if I could you know, re-describe it, I think it's one of the greatest plastic powers. And I'm not sure that that will come through in this documentary, but it's, uh, of the plastic power applied to even the idea of death. How can I recruit my death or involve my death to the point where even my death is part of a, a display, a performance uh, on the stage of metaphysics, or you, know, you, you can define the performance. But uh, this is, I gave a talk on this once, this is exemplified by the death of Socrates, who in the, this is the height of the psychodrama of old Europe, before Christ, he involves the specter of his death in a way where he controls the passion play. He superordinates the voluntary over the compulsory. Yes, the court hands him down this sentence, uh, but he recruits it in a way that he's directing the passion play himself. It's a beautiful death performance. And of course, it restructures the thinking, like I said, of old Europe before Christ. He is a death athlete. Nietzsche says, we have to use plastic powers and we have to use history in specific ways to overcome the accumulation of history and of science, which itself is, is stultifying, it suffocates life. And ultimately, if there is a use of history at all in Nietzsche's essay, it's to support life, to support action, our projects, and to help us integrate what has come, what has passed, what is foreign, to take the brute facts of what is, and to help us say, what shall be? Uh, I hope I'm not being too grandiose right now. Uh, <laughs> so there are three forms of historiography 
and the second of the untimely meditations. These are the three uses of history that all people can put history to use for, according to Nietzsche. These are uh, the monumental form, which is my favorite. We'll explain each. Uh, the antiquarian form and the critical form. Uh, he says each of these forms, it's kind of like the Aristotelian forms of government. They exist independently. They have their own sovereignties. No one should control the others, and everything's out of balance, and, and you wreck yourself if you just rely on one. You have to know when to apply each of the forms, and when to use history to the advantage of life, and not misuse the others. Perhaps you're not the right person to use one of these forms of history. Not the right person yet. Uh, the first of the great forms of historiography to Nietzsche is, is called the monumental form. It's my favorite. It's very romantic. It's Nietzsche's favorite. He thinks superior people or excellent projects should think this way. Why do we need history? We need examples. We need great models. We need reminders that greatness is possible, that defying the odds is, not, is achievable. We need consolation in times, especially like in modernity. We need consolation um, that what is isn't what has to be. We don't have to settle. These are just glancing, you know, sketch remarks. Uh, but, you know, the important characterization of this form of history is that you can think of history as a, uh, links in a great chain of being, like these mountaintops. There are people, there are great men or there are great women who have sent letters to each other from across the ages. They are senders and receivers, right? We think of Machiavelli's letter to Vittori. Uh, I come into the, the court of the ancients. I am received with kindness. Uh, I spend time with him. They answer my questions. Uh, a beautiful statement of like the European Renaissance. Now, is Machiavelli a figure of the European Renaissance? I don't know, but he believed in the monumental form of history. This is often something we find among the Florentines, right? Like we study the classics to meet a model, but not just to meet them, because we need help trying to exceed them. We're trying to do something beautiful. We're trying to do something artistic, something that's never been done before. You can think of Cellini in his autobiography, he, you know, when he makes the Perseus, or when he makes even these small things in the court of Francis or other people. Uh, he's most pleased when the Pope or someone compliments him and says, you know, this is better than anything uh, that the Romans ever made. Uh, it's a beautiful form of history. It, of course, has a negative side. That negative side of the monumental form is uh, you really overlook a lot. Okay, you're not interested in what's down below the peaks of these mountains. And then, of course, that requires a lot of glossing, a lot of distortion. Uh, and ultimately, it's an, it's an ahistorical point of view. Uh, it's, you, you just condense a lot of causes and effects. You ignore them, and, and you have this completely distorted sense of why things actually happen. Uh, and you'll convince yourself into something suicidal and fanatic uh, if you only have the monumental form of history. Uh, let's see, five minutes, damn. Uh, okay, so the second form is the antiquarian form. That form is perhaps more comfortable to some of us who are in a technology background or an internet cultural background. Uh, we have a craze for collecting, for minutia, for trivia. You know, we edit Wikipedia. We love it. Um, the antiquarian form makes sense in that we can uh, preserve, identify. It, it forms a certain kind of piety, right? Certain kind of norms. Uh, we love this as humans. Like we love to collect and bound ourselves and define a horizon of community and belonging to togetherness, pattern identification. Like it's it's amazing, and we should be very thankful for the antiquarians uh, because they have uh, they have preserved identities and customs and avoided destruction. Uh, there's a number of reasons to, to praise the antiquarian form. Uh, and of course, it's a form that, that I'm familiar with in the gun space, and we'll get to that. But of course, its downside is that uh, you begin to lose perspective. Everything gets a close look. Everything has a mania, uh, or you have a mania for, for collecting books or museumification. Things begin to take on an unwarranted aspect of your study, an unwarranted attention. Uh, it can be ultimately a, a cynical kind of thing, and you can adopt a super historical point of view, which kind of bleeds events, items, people of their urgency, of their passion, of, of why they did what they did. You just see them all in this kind of uh, antiseptic point of view. Uh, the final form of history in, in Nietzsche's untimely meditation is the critical form. I know especially on like internet circles, we may disagree about things like the French Revolution, the necessity of terror, the necessity of political violence. I'm right there with you. Uh, the point is that the, the critical form should be employed, uh, according to Nietzsche, in these rare moments where we are actually oppressed, we are desperate to overcome, and we need desperately to judge and destroy and dispense with what has come before, an institution, a custom, a way of looking at things. The critical mode is good for destroying. Uh, but of course, if something's very good for destroying, um, life cannot exist in that environment. It's not good to germinate something new. It's only good to destroy. And as a friend of mine has said, when you're destroying things, it almost doesn't matter how you do it. 
uh, when you're building important things, those initial environmental conditions very much matter. Uh, so critical form is quite a dangerous thing. Uh, so I've applied each of these, I think, at times, like we all have in our, in our work, like we, we apply the different modes of history, the different uses of history in different ways. Like, okay, I printed a gun one time. I thought what I was doing, and maybe it doesn't matter what I thought, maybe it doesn't matter what we think when we use history. We're still mediated by it, we're still conscious of our historical faculty and our, our reason. I thought, okay, I'm printing a gun, what am I doing with that? Well, I'm attacking the symbolic fictions of the United States. I know that the United States doesn't actually want me to, to print a gun. And worse, I know that the United States doesn't want me to put that gun on the internet because the United States is a world striding hegemon. It believes it controls the internet. So it's like at least this two form criticism of the mythical foundations of the United States, which at least has to pay lip service to this idea of the second amendment, the citizens right to keep and bear arms. We know that it's actually institutionally hostile to that. It's a great military industrial power. It has no time for the active investment in the civic Republican idea of an armed people, a militia, something like that. Of course, this is a very particular American idea, but this is where you are. And Nietzsche says, like, when you use history, you should be in a place of trying to build a future and trying to understand the present. Uh, so that's what I thought I was doing with the gun. Okay, I put the gun on the internet, and then I realized, wow, I'm in a lot of trouble. Uh, I've applied the critical form. I've destroyed uh, the internet to some degree, and I've destroyed my life. Um, now what, do I, what am I doing? Well, the next phase of my project for, the, for those years after Liberator was about building... Uh, a company, an institution, uh, recruiting a bunch of people and building equipment, machinery, taking over an existing market in the United States called the kit gun market or the 80% market. This image represents an 80% receiver. These are important in the United States, but I realized what I was doing then, it was no longer active criticism. You could say it had an artistic dimension or, again, these are just my descriptions of it. So, you know, take it for face value. But I realized I was, I needed consolation. I needed examples. I needed mentors. I didn't have those. I had to, you know, use history to tell myself, okay, here's a rough analogy for how you build a company under adverse circumstances. Maybe here's a plan for how I can go into the U.S. courts and just kind of hold the door or put my foot in or just, I, I was engaged with our institutions in a way to where I couldn't just be a critic anymore. I had to, I had to build and I needed history and a monumental form of history, I think, uh, to find examples uh, and to use them. I was comforted, I mentioned Machiavelli earlier in the speech, I was comforted by Machiavelli. He would say, you know, good arms make good laws. And I said, well, well what do plastic arms make? Um, you know, I was, I was able to engage with history in a way that I, I hadn't before and for years because I needed to. As I move on, uh, the final form, I think where, where I've been an antiquarian, and I don't know that it's often, but has been in the, the building of this site, DevCAD, which I have tried to launch three or four different times, and to me has been an active effort to collect everything that is. Everything that was made, that is made, I recognize the half-life of these gun developers on the internet is normally only a, a couple of years. They come, they go, they disappear. There's link rot, you can't find where they deposited this stuff, it's not collected, and then occasionally it is actively purged from the platforms that you find it on. You can think of platforms like Thingiverse. Uh, these days you can think of Odyssey. The link rot is still significant on places like Odyssey, um, and even when it doesn't disappear, it is difficult to find. And this effort of mine is not from necessarily a great love of the creators of 3D printed guns, but it is from this, this feeling I have, this kind of parental feeling, or this feeling of like, um, I know that you're young, I know that you're active, you know, and your culture should be active and looking forward. I will do the gray haired work of assigning metadata to what you have built. I will collect it, I will make it to where other people can find it. And I never thought I'd be in a position like that. Perhaps it's a position like only a mature person can be in. I'm not saying that I'm a mature person, but I am saying this felt like and still feels like antiquarian work. It's work that we do every day. We employ lots of people. We've even worked with Odyssey to, you know, define universal record identifiers and applications of library science and all these things I never thought I'd be doing. I thought I was a badass, world-striding anarchist, you know? Well, it turns out, you know, most of what you do in 3D guns on my end is library science. Um, that's antiquarianism for you. Anyway, uh, I think I've applied a lot of these, and all of us at different times in our lives, uh, we apply these forms of history. So. Uh, back to our theme, the plastic power, we have to still recognize, or at least I think we should recognize that when we're moving and we're acting, and though we think we're acting in a historical way and being mediated by a, a certain particular form of history, it is nevertheless true that 
our historical conscience, or really all conscience, shrinks down to a point, and we must still assume this abyssal act. We have to act, as Goethe says, without conscience. This is in Nietzsche's essay as well. But what I'm struck with in the movie that you may see later is when I look back at this person who I don't often like to look back at, this Cody Wilson from 10 years ago, seven years ago, five years ago, when I see him in that thing, I see someone who's so in love with what he's doing. Yes, it came from a, a particular orientation, a political point of view, but he, he's only giving the rights for that thing to exist. And it's almost as if nothing else has the right to exist. There is only this project. That's almost what's required when we try to usher something new uh, into being. And it is unhistorical. Nietzsche's point is ultimately action and production, they don't really come from these studied schools or scholarship. You know, they can't be conferred upon you by a, a book. You have to act unhistorically, without conscience and without respect for existence. We need balance uh, in our lives. We have to balance our unhistorical capacity with our use of history. And this is why Nietzsche prescribes some of the plastic powers. And this is what I'm trying to get into you with right now. Uh, what's my time? 14 minutes. We're going to do it though. Okay. So when I was taken down the first time, what was left was this vacuum, uh, but also this invitation. I had refined the old Texan Gonzalez motto, come and take it which has adopted itself, you know, historically from Molan Labe, this idea at Thermopylae, this uh, provocation to authority. Okay, you want our arms? Please come and take them. Uh, that flatters the Texan and American conscience to some degree. It, it fits with American gun politics, but I thought it's just as good in, in the digital space. And there's this, there are these extra dimensions when it's digital. You see there's a file folder there now instead of a cannon. Uh, and I, I've seen some of you have the, the Gonzalez cannon on your shirts, very cool. Uh, with the file folder, though, there's this like addition of the problematic of digitality. Like, well, of course you can come and take it, right? It's infinite. It can be replicated. I always thought that was beautiful. I named my book Come and Take It because of that. But I think there's a third order at least uh, to come and take it, which is a particular provocation uh, to the community at large. It is now a mantle for you to come and take. You know, this initial precursor person has perhaps been destroyed. Can you come and take and do what is being done here? And so this invitation was an invitation to follow in my footsteps and footsteps of people before me. I called on Julian Assange and all these people and tried to give a certain, I tried to pronounce what our culture is. You know, it's open source. It puts the things on the internet. Why does it do that? Like I, I gave a certain, a certain political program and a, a persona, you could say. I asked other people to come and do that. Um, but I also asked people to misread what I was doing and to apply plastic powers. And so we're at section two already. We're getting there. Okay, so misprison or misprision is the idea here. And it basically, it, it's a poetic form of misreading. Uh, I've taken it from Harold Bloom, a literary theorist. My, my background is literature. But you can think of it to mean strong misreading, poetic misreading. Um, according to Bloom, Misprision is the central poetic act. We are, in his book, Anxiety of Influence, you know, the artist encounters true difficulty when he sees the master and when he, when he experiences the poetry of the master. He thinks, gosh, I need some way to clear imaginative space and I have to overcome this master. Okay, and you, there's lots of disputes about this poetic theory, but I think it's beautiful and I think it explains um, our historical and ahistorical drive to not be the last born, right? None of us wants to be the last born or late to the party. We would all like to be first born in our way. And so we arrive at a culture, an ongoing scene, a, a hacking project, and we realize, well, there are certain ways in which I can refound this, or there are certain ways in which this is wrong. And in fact, what I'm doing is the true way to do it. And this has happened in my space as well, I think through creative acts of poetic misreading. Um, I can use just a little bit of McLuhan here. Uh, when we march into the future, McLuhan says we are always marching backwards, right? At the, McLuhan's beautiful point here is that the advent of television, at least in America, that's what really allowed people to live on the Western frontier, what he called Bonanza Land. Uh, every night when you got home from your like, you know, total industrial alienation, you could check out what was going on in Bonanza Land. Uh, you know, the, the big screens allowed us to really imagine like the frontier in a new way. And I think that's happening with the internet. I think that's happening with 3D printing. In my particular culture of 3D printing guns in America, we see communities of people who now, through this technology, have found a way to engage with, let's say, the generation of, of gun making 100 years ago, figures like Browning and stories of the formation of Winchester, 
Colt, I, I had a, this was my, you know, 3D printed guns was my way of finding the biography of Sam Colt, for example. Uh, we're always marching backwards. These technologies allow us um, a diversion into a, a, an imagined past. Um, and of this misreading, this act of misreading is not necessarily anything new, mediated by the 20th century. Um, my favorite part of the Second Amendment and this feels, ooh, this feels like I'm gonna do Harrington dirty, but I gotta do it, okay? My favorite part of the Second Amendment is that it comes from a huge historical misreading uh, of Harrington. Now, this is a long story, so I'll try to get to the end of it, but you know, the Anglo Orient, uh, let's say like the Anglo origins of the Second Amendment come from the history of common law, let's say, uh, before the King and Parliament, this idea that the common law and the rights of Englishmen are immemorial, they're very deeply, located you know, beyond time and memory. Um, perhaps they, far, they go as far back as the Saxon chieftains. And <laughs> this was a real dispute, like in the, in the late 1600s, people began to actively invest, you know, historically verify, hey, yeah, just how old is parliament? You know, just how old are the laws of England? And um, I think the great exponent of military populism that became the core of the Second Amendment, James Harrington, you know, his innovation was to say, actually the ancient constitution of England was what was in the way. And the immemoriality, the, the, the sanctity of our laws was actually always an infirm thing. And that's why the government failed. And that's why there was a civil war. And so if you're to refound the Republic, you know, the good old cause, we have to be a people under arms and we can never return to the institutional forms that we had. Um, only 25 years later, Neville and his Plato Revivitus says, uh, Actually, the militia was always with us. We can read about it in Tacitus. The English militia is one of those features of the ancient constitution of England. It's a deep historical and poetic misreading of Harrington. And it's, it extends to the American constitution and the way that we talk about the Second Amendment today. Well, it's always been with us, this militia idea. No, it was an innovation. This is a significant misreading and it is an, an abuse of history. Uh, and yet that ideology is essential. I love it. I think it's great. We have to recognize both of these things. We have to take a super historical point of view. Uh, but I think at least in my culture of 3D printed guns, the antiquarian form dominates. And that's because there's a certain type of person who builds things, right? There's a certain type of person who uh, is software first, you know, a coder. I'm trying to be gentle, uh, but <laughs> I'm here at the Hackers Congress, you know, I'm outnumbered. But uh, I think the point is uh, the antiquarian form is comfortable and already existing on the internet. That form, uh, I'll talk about how things are grafted into that form, but that form asks a bunch of questions from a position that it doesn't recognize as a luxury position. It says, well, why did Cody Wilson say that 3D printed guns need to be open source? You know, that doesn't make sense. Can't we use the Creative Commons non-commercial 4.0 or can't we use this license? Or why didn't Cody Wilson put Liberator up? That's a shitty gun. Why would he do that? Why wouldn't he test it, you know? And why wouldn't he like build an SMG that could really help people all over the world instantaneously? And these are questions from a a point of view of antiquarian interest, and they're kind of bled of the understanding uh, of just how desperate, threadbare, uh, just how hot your blood has to be, and that you know you would actually, I, if I had the plans for an SMG and built an SMG, I would publish an SMG. Uh, so the idea is, you know, the antiquarian form doesn't quite understand why things got here, but once it has them, it's comfortable and kind of turning them over. Uh, it doesn't understand. I just put this slide in here to, to suggest what I think is happening in. in a more monumental form of, uh, of history. We're just looking for the shore, okay? When we're building something new, it is a storm. We know we have one chance. We know that there are not funds, there is not time, and our lives are short. We are just looking for the shore. If we could just make landfall, we will find the fair harbors, I promise you. We will scout and we will find a better way to do this, but please just help me find the shore. Uh, now, the Second Amendment culture online has at least recognized the weakness of personality, which can come from an antiquarian form. And Nietzsche says um, these different forms of history, when misapplied, um, breed weakness of personality. And so I will use the weak personality that Second Amendment figures have identified. This is the FUD. I should ask if any of you know him, but he's, he's quite a, he's more of an American figure. But, you know, the FUD, he's a casual, okay? <laughs> he's, and his point of view is, is pretty boomer-esque. Uh, he says, like, fine, it's great to have shooting and sporting rifles, you know, it's, I like the old NRA purposes and propaganda of firearms, but you know, 
cool it with all that revolutionary rhetoric. Um, you know, that's really not the idea. And if I hear too many bullets fired in too much succession at the range, I'm probably going to call the range officer or the ATF. Like, these are the ideas uh, of the FUD. Uh, but we recognize, I think, <laughs> let me show you how he's used in memes. Uh, when he's used in memes, you know, a, a soldier says, a young man says, oh, hey, look, Uncle June, look, Grandpa, you know, here's my new SIG rifle. And uh, our FUD, our Uncle June, he says, yeah, that's nice. But, you know, in my day, we had the M4, and we really don't need anything more than the M4. Uh, <laughs> when we move on, we see uh, Uncle June is there, uh, let's say, even in the revolution. Grandpa, you know, the British are coming. I've got this brown bass. Uh, we're going to do it. Grandpa says, no, thanks. I'll stick to my matchlock. It's okay. Uh, you know, it was good enough for Dad. It's good enough for me. Uh, when we see <laughs> Grandpa again in the far future, you know, we say, hey, Grandpa, Spartan lasers. He's like, ah, you know, I'll stay out. Um, so we begin to understand something, right, because of the, of the gun meme culture, of the weakness of these personalities. Yet, this is a dangerous thing to understand. This is a piece of wisdom. And Nietzsche says we should acquire this wisdom. But it's also a poison because this super historical point of view kind of tells us, like, there's no real, there's no real need. There's no real urgency to adopt a strong rhetorical position. Uh, you recognize the absurdity of both sides. There will always be youth, always advocating for what is new. There will always be wisdom. And Grandpa June, you know, Uncle June saying, ah, that's a gimmick. Um, that can lead you to not act. Now, this is the state uh, of gun printing on the internet right now. Can you, does this made out well right now? You would be forgiven for thinking that the real purpose of 3D gun printing online is a form of like profile creation, identity creation. And by the way, I worked really hard to find uh, the least homosexual gun project that I could find <laughs> on the internet right now. <laughs> uh, so now we're on to the third part of our lesson, which is uh, profilicity. Okay, so it turns out that... Um, Printing guns is a technology of identity, and we shouldn't be too surprised at that. Okay, well, we're printing ourselves, we're using history, we're integrating our project as a way of enunciating what's interesting and beautiful about us. I mean, we always involve ourselves in what we do, right? And accusations that, well, you know, your project um, is invalid because it's too much about you. And you recognize how like, this is a, perhaps a legitimate criticism about authenticity or sincerity, and yet in the internet, there's no way to not involve yourself in your projects. Um, anyway, profilicity, I bring up the word in the section here because it's something we all actually innately now understand, I think. We all act in profilic ways. We build profiles. We build accounts. We understand that profiles are, are contextual. There are different profiles for different purposes. And we understand second-order observation, but let's explain what that is. This is Nicholas Lemann. He's a great social systems theorist. You know, his book, Reality of Mass Media, check it out. Anyway, when he applies media theory, and he does it before social media, right? He dies in the late 90s, but he gives us this term for second-order observation. He says, well, there was the world of first-order observation and facts, but now there's the world of the presentation of facts. And what we have is a new complex form of communication and observation. It's complex and probably better and more intelligent. I'm not, what I'm about to do here is critical only in a, in a basic sense. I'm not saying it's, it's bad. We all understand how we can't go back to that world of, well, here's a picture. There's, we, we live in the world of, why am I seeing this picture? Who put it out? And why did they stage it that way? And why not another way? This is an interesting and intelligent way of engaging things. And we understand that we make up our minds about observations by how they're observed by other people. Profilicity is a technology, just like 3D printing. It's a technology of creating identity under conditions of second order observation. I'll tell you why this is important to me very soon. Here's a 3D printer and here's a little dwarf. And like Amir said, you know, my constant angst when I started this project was, it was like, damn, this is just being built by the powers that be, Amazon and everyone is, you know, what a fun new diversion for you. What a fun consumer project for you to announce your quaint particular inwardness. Gee, what a nice toy to make toys. And can it make anything else? Well, you know, we're not going to talk about that. But when, <laughs> when I wrote my book, this is from my book, by the way. Uh, these words are almost 10 years old. I wrote this in 2014. I'm not saying it's particularly good poetry or anything, but I'm saying it expressed something of my frustration of youth. Like, damn, dude. Uh, they kept asking, like, why don't you print anything else? You know, print a prosthetic. Well, it's like, fuck you guys. The printer is the fucking prosthetic. You know, like under conditions of second order observation, it's just an extension of this, of this endless 
navel gazing. Uh, and so here's a review of my book by a prominent, uh, let's say, creator on the internet. And you know, this is from 2018, so we got to cut him some slack. This laser kind of works. The book blew me away. Well, great. Uh, account verified on Amazon. Um, hearing a rumor about 3D guns, I checked this book out. Now, what does he tell you in the review? He tells you that uh, actually nothing contained in the book at all in that um, there's a personal use exemption for guns, uh, which doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything in US law. I guess he's trying to say, there's a story here. This is worth it. This got me into a hobby. It made me realize there's a legal way to make guns. Well, OK, that's something. you know. And it's difficult for me to, to be fair here. I don't know that I should be. But the point of my book, if anything, right? and, and that's just, you know, just words from the author here, uh, I wasn't trying to teach you that, hey, it's fun and cool to have a hobby building legal guns. I was trying to say something about the structure of law itself, its attempt to encapsulate an activity that can't be encapsulated, and that ultimately you can play with the law, like the toys that you want to print. Um, this was missed on the reviewer, but we recognize that mm, even when we make things, right? We make things under second order observation, just like me making the book, right? I'm not, I'm not excused from this. Um, this is captured better, again, in a great gun meme. It's like, well, if the origin of 3D guns were privacy, escaping, you know, like knowing that I have something that the government can't know about, well, under conditions of second order observation and pro felicity, I have to keep talking about it. Uh, in fact, I can't stop talking about it. And even when I'm a, a prolific creator, I say, hey, folks, all you private gun printers out there, use my Amazon link uh, for this great discount code on Chinese 3D printable plastic. Um, <laughs> so uh, this guy is actually in the movie that you'll see later. And he says, well, you can read what he says, but he's like, it's uh, important, right? It's very important that we are observed being observed. And um, this guy spends a lot of time crafting a persona of being very private, right? But then you recognize the tension under pro felicity, right? Like I have to keep telling you that I'm private. I have to produce all this information and metadata about just how private I am, and I need you to know. Um, and I'm not, look, this feels like I'm being you know, mean or something, right? Uh, but this is just where we are. And <laughs> I guess to bring McLuhan in again, it's like we think the content of our projects and our messages in these new media is the posts we make, the words we say. And McLuhan would remind us that the content is actually the character of that media, the type of person being created. And so you'll see this guy later. See if you can find the guy in the mask later in the movie, okay? And make a judgment about that character. Uh, this is Jay Stark. Anyone in the audience, you must have all heard of Jay Stark by now? Most, some, you know. He, he is a, a great figure in the movement and now represents a certain martyrdom. Uh, and that's very useful, right? There's a use of history in presenting him that way, a monumental form, I would say. Yet his death under conditions of pro-felicity presents lots of problems. And I would now like to assess some of the less humorous plastic powers or lack thereof of the current community um, in the wake of his death. So that's pretty readable, yeah. Okay, so this is one of the prominent figures online. And of course, his persona is equally as dedicated to that other guy as that other guy. Uh, uh, you gotta know that this guy thinks he's very private. Okay, no one's gonna find out who he is. Here he is in this tweet making fun of this guy. This is one of the, like the dogs that our community regularly beats. Uh, and this guy like walks back like a beaten dog to be beaten again. It's kind of pathetic, but he's making fun of this guy for doxing himself, right? And here's the document how, so he's actually helping that guy now be doxed, 50,000 people saw it. The important thing here is that you know uh, that our creator, Mr. Freeman, very intelligent, doesn't dox himself, won't be doxed, and that's somehow we know after JSTARC that it's very important to not be identified and to, pr to print in an anonymous fashion. Okay, message received. And I've also received a message about who this person is. Um, this is a court order from a federal court in New York um, just a few days ago, September 27th. Uh, Freeman was in a lawsuit with us against Every Town for Gun Safety. He was a co-defendant. I had organized the defense, uh, common defense agreement of that lawsuit with the Farmers Policy Coalition. I had settled every defendant out of that case except Freeman. Um, now, if you can see there, uh, Freeman's being ordered by the court to provide his name and address to the court by October 4th. Uh, I guess that's what, next week? 
It's next week. Now, I don't think Freeman will deliver his name and address to the court. The problem here is that his motion to dismiss was denied. He is stuck in this lawsuit with a judge who has asserted jurisdiction, and he has flaunted the fact online um, that he will not provide that information to the judge. Uh, you see here in a March 23 Reddit thread, Freeman says, hey, I settled the lawsuit. Everything's settled. Ask me anything. Critical mistake. Uh, he's still in the lawsuit. You know, you've had that dream where like you're in high school or college, you're about to graduate and you realize, oh shit, I didn't go to that class for like the whole year. You, you know the dream I'm talking about? Uh, that guy's living this dream. Um, he will never be out of this lawsuit and the plaintiffs will always pursue his identity. And so you, you see one of these ironies where we promote this idea that we'll be, we will be private. And now a federal judge is very interested in who we are. Um, Nietzsche calls this ability, or let's say this inability to stop fucking talking, uh, impotentia. He borrows it from the Romans. They say, like, when you have the critical faculty, when you cannot stop writing criticism down, when you cannot turn it off, you are enfeebled and you are made weak. My community has been made impotent by this inability to stop crafting profiles off of our proposed, supposed values. Um, this is a harder point to make, but... There was a group built uh, after my company, Defense Distributed, they call themselves uh, Deterrence Dispensed. And they accepted the mantle, uh, the charge that I had given them, and then decided in 21, please bear with us, we're gonna transition to a new website called The Gatalog. Here's them promoting my files, by the way, despite all the abuse that they give me, they still haven't taken that down. The idea that I'm trying to convey here is this transition has now lasted three years and they're not able to make it. For some reason, they can't move past um, this requirement of theirs to change or shift identity. And I would say this is one of the more notable examples of, of impotentia in the space. And I think I have an explanation as to why. We're back to JSTAR. When we recognize that even the death of our hero the person who got us into the movement has just become bricolage, you know, something that we can just, again, apply in this, this constant need to update our profiles. Um, we, we are blind to the fact that we are stuck. We, are, we have overused a certain form of history. The antiquarian form has dominated, and uh, we get really negative consequences. And so there are taboos now in the gun space which are antithetical to the original um, propositions, or let's say values of 3D printed guns. And these taboos come from, I believe, this sequence of events. This sequence of events is the invention itself of Gatalog. We know a few things about the death of Jay Stark. Um, he was raided by German authorities in June of, of 21. This is shortly after he released the FGC, uh, it's a typo, this is the FGC Mark II. It was released in April, mid-April of, of 21. That community, uh, deterrence dispensed, were upset that they didn't make any money on the release of that gun. I think the, what was conveyed to me was they made $25. They didn't like that. And so they asked for $2,500 to license it open source on my site. And if you go check out the origins of the FGC Mark II, it was launched originally uh, on DevCAD. And I will tell you, it was for $2,500. That was quite a bit of controversy about using money to license a file open source, but it happened. Shortly after it happened, though, Jay Stark died. And in the middle, this foundation uh, was formed in Florida to, I don't know, be the new way that like they were going to license files open source or something. They had imagined that they'd build an institution that would, I don't know, use uh, Farms Policy Coalition money or something to take their grand designs, issue them, and, and continue to make money on putting them out open source. It all kind of makes sense, you know? And, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. They don't have to be accountable for experimenting and doing something new. But this sequence, I think, created a taboo uh, because their plans to transition, as you saw on the earlier slide, were interrupted with the death of their founder. And you could say they may have been responsible for the death of their founder. As we, as we learned, it's not often commented upon now, but it was actual, it was financial authorities who gave information on the death of Jay Stark to German authorities. British financial service provider, I think is what they call it. Some people think it was Coinbase, but the point is it was how they were moving money that identified Jay Stark. It was because they weren't being careful. They were too caught up in the creation of the profile not just of JSTARC, but of themselves, 
uh, and they forgot the reality. They forgot that authority was actively interested in who they were and would destroy them. Uh, and so for, it's, you know, there's, there's almost like a Greek tragic element here, right? Like for reasons of profilicity and, and youth, uh, they killed their founder and just created a permanent aversion for the commercial side of open source firearms, speaking to journalists, which is now deeply taboo in the space. Uh, and I guess there are some other things to add, but uh, you can understand what I'm getting at. If there's going to be a use of history in my space, 3D gun space, it has to come from a realization of a, of a need for unity, that there are plastic powers where we have to take what is adverse to us, the fact that what we're doing is we'll never be allowed to win, and that, you know, it, it is true that one form, uh, one story about what we're doing is it's always going to be a long defeat. We have to take that, we have to integrate that. We have to have the reserves, the horizon, and the strong plastic powers within ourselves to use it nevertheless and to make it our blood. Uh, those are words from Nietzsche. Now, that's kind of the idea in the death athletic. Like, I would use my own death to complete my project if I could, right? I would recruit it, I would involve it, I would help it be the capstone, you know, in its, in its deployment. I mean, that's, like I said earlier, the strongest use of a plastic power, but there are others. I gave other speeches in the past. One's called, you know, building an igloo. I borrowed that from Younger. The idea was, um, gee, you know, when he observed the Eskimos, all these powers that they've, they've made to protect themselves against the cold, and they did it all with ice. You know, you can use uh, the rules of the powers that be, and you don't have to submit to them. You can use the rules of the powers that be uh, and even take shelter in them if you can. There are many plastic powers, and you don't just have to be like a, a fanatical suicidal maniac. Um, I think the point is you, you have to pursue this unity because there's only peril uh, with an imbalance and with only thinking unhistorically, right? You'll kill yourself and you'll kill others. But if you only think historically, you won't have the power to do anything. You have to find a way to do both. Um, your inwardness and your outwardness, their intention, but you have to make the match. You have to have a plastic power to take that binary and mold it. That's the end of my speech. Thanks. Hey, we're on time too, so. Is it a, uh, will there be Q&A? Fantastic, be yes, of course. Um, I'm sure there are many questions right now, and yeah, let's just jump right into it. Who has the uh, first question to ask? Uh, everyone is very shy. Okay, I see. I, I see. It's fine if there's none. Yeah. It, should I give the mic or? Uh... Oh, we have a... Okay, yeah, got it. Uh, would you care give us a bit of a background of your, like, uh, um, uh, well, the delay you had? <laughs> because uh, Absolutely, yeah. I. I, I think many people thought that it's still not sorted out, so if you don't mind. Well, I guess one of my uh, points from this speech is like nothing's ever sorted out, homeboy, but uh, my delay. In the end, I was put on probation for three years. I completed my probation in November of 22, and uh, sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you have good lawyers, so I, I never had to take a conviction. I never had to agree that you know I committed the crime that was committed outside of a guilty plea to a single charge that they gave me in Travis County. So right now in Travis County, I have an arrest record and uh, a ruined reputation, but you know, who, who counts? Uh, so, I mean, that's it, right? Until the next one, right? Until the next time someone has something. I figured, you know, this is the first time I've traveled to Europe in five years. I figured something would, would happen because, I mean, there was an Interpol warrant, right? Like, surely someone will have something to say. Uh, I got to the checkpoint. He's like, oh, what are you here for? I'm like, a speech, you know. Uh, and then he's like, well, what's the speech on? I said, technology. Uh, so, so far, so good. <laughs> I saw someone wearing a, a DD shirt. There you are. Nice shirt, man. <laughs> I saw you on the streets of Prague. I was like, hell yeah. Uh, I'm like, oh yeah, the talk. Um, very cool. Yeah, all right, any more? Uh, yeah, we have one more question there. Uh, 
Yeah. Um, so given kind of the nature of your delay, so to speak, wouldn't that affect your ability to legally operate firearms in the United States? I'll restate. Uh, because I didn't take a conviction, right? In the United States, you know, there's a prohibition on possession if you're a felon, right? Well, I didn't take a felony conviction. And so not being a felon, I have no impediment to my keeping and bearing arms. But I love this. Even while I was under indictment, there were certain rules for my indictment, like Texas state rules. Well, you can't possess firearms while you're indicted. Maybe you can possess your own. What's beautiful is I run a company that doesn't make firearms. I run, I run a company that makes incomplete firearms. And so uh, I only ever possessed incomplete firearms for the last three years. Makes sense. Here's one. I like the analogy of the the storm to, to try to get to shore. Uh, what what storm are you in now, and what's what's the shore you're going for? Just existence. Uh, look, I think I think the storm I'm in right now is like I, I know absolutely, absolutely. I have proof that I can't make it. Like California, just two days ago, banned um, under penalty, like severe civil penalty, the sharing of of files from our site, DefCAD. They also banned selling 3D printers. If you sell them on a website that advertises the fact that you can make guns, there's so many ways that uh, county, city attorneys, and state attorney general just in California can get me now. And I've been there already in New York and New Jersey. I've been suing New Jersey on this exact question of sharing 3D files since November of 2018. Like you cannot win. You cannot beat these people. Now, often what I what I say people, what I say to people about this is like, that's okay. Winning is one of the quickest ways to lose. Uh, so you know, there's there's lots of things you can do with this understanding, and you should recruit uh, history to assist you and great plastic powers. Like, what will I do now that my website literally can't share files to California? There's like you know, 25 million people who could have downloaded them just last week. I don't know the answer to this, but like, it's my purpose to find a way to solve it. And solving it doesn't necessarily always mean what you think. So like in the Death Athletic, okay, you, you find yourself in this sh on this ship. Like what's my original destination? I just want to preserve this gun that I've put on the internet. It's just this one thing. And the State Department asked me to take it down. Well, then I need to sue the State Department to you know, fight about like whether it can go up on the internet or not. Well, how do you get the money to sue the State Department? Okay, I'll build this new project uh, about incomplete guns and this machine that will make them. Okay, well then they attack that, right? And on and on and on. And so I've had to now defend against just the production of that machine. And you forget, right? You forget the purpose that you set out on your little journey with in your little wooden ship. You know, a story I had about myself in the beginning of Jessica's film, there's Jessica, is, well, I run a software company, okay? Uh, and now the story I have about myself today is I run a hardware company. And I don't know what the story will be tomorrow. I think the only credible thing is that I'm absolutely dedicated to that evolution. That's the best I can say. Yeah, you know, in the earlier part of your talk, you mentioned uh, metaphysics. Mm. So I guess like taking this super history perspective, like, do you have any thoughts on what's the use of metaphysics? Damn. What a question. Um, I mean, you know, on a good day, I try to be like uh, an existentialist in the mold of Camus or something, you know, or, or sometimes I like Nietzsche's like kind of naive anti-metaphysics, like it doesn't matter, there's no hinterworld. And yet, you know, I know that I'm molded by um, Americanism, Christianity, and, you know, like uh, we're all seduced by narratives of the purpose and the philosophy of history. Uh, I love these questions. Um, and so I think it is, it's naive to be strictly anti-metaphysical. And so I have tried to use over time Baudrillard, for example. I could have just as easily spoken of Baudrillard in my part about Luhmann. Luhmann says, well, there's facts and there's a presentation of facts. Baudrillard tells us there's power, but power is really the presentation of the science of power. You know, like uh, media theory and metaphysics are still really operative, and I rely on them, even if I'm uh, shy about committing to a position. Uh, as we've seen from a conflict about a thousand kilometers to the east of here, small <laughs> arms are probably not the premier weapon on the battlefield today. If you were starting a project like this today, would you focus on firearms or would you look at, say, weaponized drones or other systems like that? It's, you know, it's funny you say that. I take the opposite view though. I think, you know, small arms and drones, small drones are, you know, dispositive. And in fact, there's not enough heavy artillery 
there's not going to be, you know, like tanks are almost useless, you understand? Like, um, and we take that lesson from Afghanistan as well. Okay, they won. They won with small arms. They had nothing else. And then as a bonus, they get institutional first world military equipment at the end, you know? Um, you know, that's how these things work, so. Uh, my, my buddy Sean and I, yeah, well, we talk about weaponized drones all the time, but um, some of the, the problem is in the United States, that's difficult to make commercial. We would have to make it commercial outside the United States. And I don't know, because I'm in love with this kind of original thing I set out to do. Like, it feels to me like a diversion. But if you were to start some kind of European weapon project, yeah, I, <laughs> I feel like drones would be a great place to start. Uh, and what Turkey has done is really amazing. And the innovations of Iran as well. Um, small drones that can be weaponized, or let's say the drone itself is the weapon, right? I've seen some uh, commercial Russian stuff. I haven't put my hands on it yet, but it has been offered to me. I mean, damn, the, the era of the suicide drone. I mean, FPV suicide drones, oh boy, that's crazy. And uh, definitely effective. I, I've heard per every square kilometer right now on the front or in the gray zone on Ukraine, there's something like a thousand drones. Um, damn. So yeah, new subjectivity, new projects. What, what I'm doing kind of fits in a conversation that's about 10 years old. I'm not saying that that conversation's over. Um, and I think there still needs to be people at that post to have it. I feel a fidelity to that conversation. Yeah, great talk. Uh, Thanks. Could you say a bit more about what Defense Distributed is working on at the moment and where you see it going in the future? Uh, at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned this AI, and maybe that came across as a joke. Uh, it's called GAT GPT. Ha ha, very funny. But no, like I'm trying to do it. There you are. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to make an AI. What you realize is, okay, I've built for 10 years, I've built this like big database of all these 2D and 3D gun blueprints. Hmm, what happens when you have a database? Oh, I can train on that database, right? I can slam that into a bunch of GPUs and begin to learn some things. And then uh, this is the beauty of the ambiguity of historiography, right? Like. Uh, all this data that is ostensibly public in the United States, all this 2D data um, that the Army Publishing Directorate and all these other people have maintained and have to still pay lip service to the idea that the public owns it, uh, you can train on that data too. And no one's training on it. All you get is this anthropic bullshit and this open AI bullshit where it's like, well, we'll put in safeguards, don't worry about it, it won't be toxic. And it's like, ah, you know, mine will probably be toxic. You know? <laughs> you know. Thanks, great. Uh, so I, I'm working on that where we have a, a great team, a good ML team. We've had ML for a while. It's not like I just stepped into chatbots. I wasn't doing chatbots originally. We were doing text-to-speech. Um, we, before easy commercial text-to-speech was there, we had replicated Kamala Harris and the Attorney General of New Jersey and ha ha, we loved it so much. Uh, we even put Kamala in the, to be our, like our spokesperson in some of our little commercials on YouTube and stuff. Uh, and then I, I felt justified, you know, retroactively because uh, uh, Joe Biden, like a year ago, made Kamala the, the AI czar in the United States. I was like, gotcha, bitch. Uh, just little victories, you know. Uh, you count them where you can. So I think AI right now. I have a question myself, maybe a two-part question. If you're getting too much comments from eco-conscious community about microplastics in the water, and the second part, if it's possible to make gun parts yeah. with a recycled material, like eco-friendly yeah. gun. You know what? I wanted, to, I wanted to put this in my talk. I wanted to put this in my talk, and I felt like ah, I would kind of take away from the seriousness of the point I want to make at the end. But it's like, you know, Nietzsche says, like, ah, the plastic power. You have to take what's in the past and oh, make it your blood, you know? And I was going to say, remember, kids, don't put plastic in your blood. Use plastic to make your blood. <laughs> it's, a, it's a refined point. Uh, no, I don't get any serious criticism about environmental impact. Um, I, I like Zizek on this question. Probably you've, you've heard his bit about environmentally sustainable bullets, right? Like uh, it's, it's important not just to poison the earth with lead, but also perhaps after we end the war in Ukraine, you know, many trees will bloom from the seeds that are in the bullets and stuff. This is a uh, perverse, you know something like deeply obscene about it. Uh, I uh, reserve the right to not be concerned with questions of environmental impact. All right. Great. Um, any more, I think we have time for maybe one, one last question. Two more questions. Yeah. Got it? Test. Yeah. Thanks. Test, test. Thank you for your lovely speech and uh, lots of interesting content. Did you say filthy speech? Lovely, I said lovely. Okay. No, the opposite. 
I was it like, was wow. Speech. Yeah. Um, the question <laughs> was in many interesting terms, concepts, um, but I'm just going to hone in on one of them because uh, it's not it's one that I don't recognize. Um, can you explain the dialectics of hacking? Oh, interesting. Yeah, well, actually, it is as Hegelian as it sounds. Um, my friend, Mr. Soderbergh, you can check out his Hacking Capitalism on Amazon. I think he's just released his Dialectics of Hacking as well. And uh, we were in conversation ever since 2011. He's a doctrinaire Marxist, okay? Like he actually still thinks, and I'm not, uh, <laughs> not trying to make fun of him, but you know, he actually thinks you can apply um, doctrinaire Marxism to questions of open source uh, commitment, subcultural attitudes and all these things. And I, I recognize there is harmony in his assessment and mine. We have the famous essays by um, you know, ESR and other people about, well, this is how open source is done. And yet open source in practice is done in a completely different way. It's very petty. Um, it's very allergic uh, to capital. And you know, there's truth in some of what he's saying. So simply put, the dialectics of hacking, at least in, from Soderbergh, is strictly a Marxist way to uh, approach what is happening as an anti-capitalist you know, ultimately Hegelian system. And uh, I don't like world process in Hegel, just for the record. And Nietzsche would say uh, a Hegelian view of history is like the most abominable thing. Uh, we tell ourselves like not only, uh, <laughs> basically we tell ourselves that where we are right now is just fine. We're basically God's history was leading all up to this and it kind of bleeds you of any, of any reason or stimulus to act. Yeah. Great. Yeah.